condition. For example, there are physical constraints, chemical constraints, logical constraints, and historical constraints. We might want to add to that list computational or information processing constraints. Are these constraints important in evolution, in particular this computational constraint, and has the balance of them changed over evolutionary history? Richard Dawkins. Gosh, that's a question that I've never met before. A computational constraint. I'm not sure I can even imagine what that might be. Well, well, Colin would you like to start? I mean, I, I'm, I'm genuinely fascinated, but I think we need to get a bit of a seminar going here to, to um, um, see what a, what a computational constraint might, might be. Well, Colin, Colin, stand up again and uh, explain further. So, for example, the ability of some part of the of, the, of an organism to compute some something or to process information about its environment, might these things contribute to, to fitness in the same way that, that physics contributes to the fitness of the, the structure of our, of our, of our bodies? So oh, well, if, if you mean uh, that um, computation in the literal sense of what a brain does, then clearly there's a sense in which uh, at least those species that have big brains use them for computation and presumably it's useful that they do. When you ask what they compute, well, I imagine they're computing the optimum behavior, the optimum strategy to adopt in a particular environmental situation. And that can get very complicated indeed and the computational demands uh, could be very formidable. I haven't realized that's what you meant and, that, and I think that, um, that that's got to be true in some cases, and in, in a way the question then becomes, well, why are so many organisms still around that don't have computational equipment like we do? Maybe we get a sort of uh, computer-centric view because we happen to have big brains, and other mammals do to a lesser extent as well. But I think that there, there may be a sense in which the, the whole genome of a species which, as Steve has just told us, is a, is a constantly reshuffled uh, data pool. The whole genome of a species could in some sense be said to be doing something a bit like computation. And uh, you could look at it this way. You could say, because natural selection of past generations, natural selection of ancestors, has winnowed out and favored those genes that in combination with each other program the development of bodies that survive in past environments, the genes of a species could be thought of as a database of information about ancestral environments. And I could imagine reconstructing the environment in which the ancestors of a species lived by a sufficiently sophisticated computer examining the genes which are being reshuffled in the gene pool of that species. So if you looked at, say, the gene pool of, the species of, of a species of mole, you would find, in a sense, a description of the underground world of the ancestors of those moles. If you looked at the uh, genes of a herring, you would find a description of life in the uh, surface layers of the sea. So I do think there might be, in addition to the obvious sense in which nervous systems are evolved computers for computing things about the environment in short time, in that in, during the lifetime of the individual from moment to moment, from minute to minute, from second to second. There's also a sense in which in evolutionary time, the gene pool, the changing gene pool of a species, is a shifting database which can almost be said to be making computations about the optimum way to survive in the environment of that species. So, Lewis. I just want to point out, I don't know whether you and I have a different concept of constraints. The development of the embryo 
strongly constrains what it can evolve into. In other words, if I gave you some mice and said you can have, a, you can have 500 years or 5,000 years, you're not allowed to look at the genome, but you can do as much selection as you like. Can you get them, do you think you could be, ever get them to evolve wings which were feathered? And the answer is no, because there just have to be too many. So this is what I mean, developmental constraints. The way the embryo develops at a particular time constrains how the embryo can evolve. I can give you many more examples. I think there's one computational constraint um, in the more precise sense, which is about the nature of the code which all creatures are built on. I mean, computers, as I understand it, might even way larger than binary codes. Um, of course, as we all know, uh, life is a remarkably simple and remarkably consistent coding system. There are four, um, generally speaking, four bases. Uh, works in triplets and make 20 amino acids, which are shared by the whole of life, with the exception of a few, of many bacteria in our care. Now, that's an extraordinarily simple computer system. I mean, why haven't we come up with, um, with a, an eight-base system, say, with 500 amino acids? And it's very hard to know, but the standard response is to go back and say, well, actually, most of these constraints are historical constraints. As indeed Lewis's example of mice and feathers growing on mice is a historic constraint. That's why pigs can't fly. Pigs can't fly because they descend from ancestors without wings. Okay, it's as simple as that. Um, now it may well be that the very first life system to get going was simple, had a four base computing system. Um, it got going, and once it got going, there was no room for anybody else. Um, and we're stuck with it. Now, if we could set up a system with a better computer base, it might do better. And we might be able to do that. Craig Venter, who's a bit out of, a bit out of libel in here, um, an unusual molecular biologist in the States, um, is talking about doing this, making new kinds of creature with new kinds of genetic code. Uh, it's an interesting and risky thing to do, but it will be to escape from these competitions you talked about. Um, Roger, could, could I just reply to to Lewis, uh, the, the, when he says that you absolutely couldn't breed uh, uh, wings with feathers from a mouse, um, you didn't give yourself enough time. Um, if you, because think about it like this, or at least answer me why you couldn't do this. Since mice and birds have a common ancestor, theoretically, couldn't you just simply work your way back to the common ancestor and then work your way forward again? Um, and, and, and evolve feathers that way. It would take a hell of a long I think, time. I think Lewis is too long to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I, I'm not very keen on doing that. But it's not just the feathers, it's getting wings it's on the back. <laughs> the point is, no matter what you do, since every living creature has a common ancestor with every other one, why can't you go back to the fork? Do you know, do, Lewis, Lewis will know, of course, what the French for mouse is. The French, sorry, the French for bat, the bat, a bat is, it's chauve souris. A chauve souris literally means a shaved mouse. And of course, apart from a few details, bats and mice are the same. There's no difference between them. Mammals are quite closely related. One of them flies, okay? It doesn't do it in the same way as birds do, but it flies. So if you said, can you make me a mouse that flies? I would be not surprised if you could make a mouse that flies, but it wouldn't have feathered wings, it would do it in a different way, because evolution is very pragmatic, it builds on what it's got. So give me the grant and I'll give you the five minutes. No, I'm terribly sorry for my take, but I, I do remember having this discussion with the, with the physicist once, and I said it would take too long. He said, but you could take the time, and then everything is possible given time. I said, is it possible that you could wake up tomorrow morning as a platypus? He said, it's a very small chance, but it could happen. <laughs> so I, I said, I think we've ended the conversation. <laughs> that does end the conversation. That does end the conversation. But no, 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 neither of my colleagues has, has answered my point. What is wrong with going back to the common ancestor? I, I think there is something wrong, but you haven't answered it. But I don't know, how, I don't know what it means to go back. Here's a mouse. How do I go back? You select for a pre-mouse, a mouse that's a little bit less like a mouse, a little bit further back towards a lizard, not a lizard, but you know, I mean, a common ancestor of a rat and a, and a bird. I don't think it would help you one iota. You haven't thought it through then, though, is it? <laughs> well, I think I have, because all I see is you're going back. That's 
so what? Then you're going to come forward again. You still don't know how, to, how many genes you've got to change there's in order to get wings on the back. All I'm saying is that there is a trajectory. It, it, we know that there's a trajectory because we know that there's a trajectory. Now, I think you possibly couldn't do it because I think there may be irreversible mutations uh, which have supervened in the forward direction, so you probably couldn't actually go backwards. But nevertheless, I think that's the right answer to my riddle. I think we should put a PhD student on it. Okay, we've had